Okay, honestly, I am not excited about what I'm about to do. Ready? Pause. That's me one week in the future. Because today, I learned something that was pretty upsetting. This is my debit card. It also happens to be how much plastic we apparently consume per week, according to one study. Scientists in the Journal of Hazardous Materials estimate that we may consume 0.1 to 5 grams of microplastics a week. That's the equivalent to this. I've heard so much over the last few years about how microplastics are entering the environment, our food, even our organs. It's really worrying. We're living in a world where we're funding the problem faster than the fix. Plastic cleanup gets billions, but new plastic production gets hundreds of billions. On the bright side, new tech can now eat plastic, trap it, or replace it. The question is, will it help us in time? I want to see how bad this really is. So I'm gonna test myself for microplastics. How much plastic is actually in my blood? Because if microplastics are already inside our bodies, I need to know, can these biotech companies really engineer a scalable way to get plastics out of our environment before it's too late? And will these solutions be commercialized fast enough to actually matter? Part of the problem to me is that no one really in the system is taking responsibility. All right, let's get these tests ordered. So the FDA actually hasn't approved any tests specifically for microplastics. So these are all direct to consumer lab driven tests. None of these tests have a standardized range of what normal or healthy microplastic levels are. They just tell you what the range is they've tested and where you fit in that. Which makes sense given the first study of microplastics in human stool was done in 2019. And the first study to detect microplastics in blood was 2022. This is still a pretty novel field of study. I'm gonna go with Blueprint because they claim to use a plastic free testing method called fluorescent microscopy, which can detect microplastics down to one micrometer. That's pretty small. That does mean the nanoplastic range could be out of reach, but that is better than Keyspan's range because they can only detect up to 10 micrometers. Side note, Blueprint is by Brian Johnson, the guy who's like trying to live forever. I'm, I'm sure you guys have seen his stuff online. Crazy how all of this is shaping up. Let's get this ordered. Okay, let's do this. Oh boy, whoa. Gauze pad, bandages. <laughs> okay, so I have to fill one of these five circles. Oh. Wow, like a medieval tool. <laughs> okay, why am I unreasonably scared? I feel like this won't really hurt, but brick. That does hurt, ow. <laughs> why did I decide to do this? <gasps> We're doing it. I'm so happy I'm bleeding. <laughs> okay, that is finished. Let's get this shipped off. Okay, it's gonna take four to six weeks to actually get my results. So while we wait, let's talk a little bit about how we got here. There are pretty much two categories of microplastics, primary and secondary. Primary microplastics are made small on purpose. So think microbeads, the tiny plastics that used to be used in like body scrubs and stuff like that, which is thankfully banned in many countries. There are also industrial nurdles, the tiny raw ingredients of most plastic products. And sadly, trillions are spilled each year in transport. The secondary category is plastics that start big, but degrade in size and become smaller. This is stuff like tires, synthetic fibers like nylon or polyester and clothing, fishing time and maritime gear, even household items like sponges and plastic cutting boards. That's microplastics, but what about plastics themselves? Understanding the difference will help us understand how microplastic mitigation companies do their thing. Stick with me here. Plastic is a polymer which is basically a large molecule of repeating smaller molecules, monomers. There are seven different kinds of the most used plastics, but for our purposes, we're just gonna focus on one, PET, polyethylene terephthalate. PET is the one you'll likely hear the most about because it's used in single-use plastics like water and soda bottles, polyester clothing, and many other applications. So there are three ways to mitigate microplastics that come primarily from PET. The first is breaking it down. A French company called Carbios blew up in 2020 because it developed an enzyme that could break down PET polymers into its base monomers, which can then be recycled back into plastic. Pretty revolutionary. Companies like PepsiCo, Nestle, Suntory, and L'Oreal all partnered with Carbios back in 2019 with the goal of scaling PET biorecycling. 
Ionica uses another method entirely, a chemical recycling process that breaks PET down into its base monomers. Yeah. Look at that. Good job. Similar to Carbios, Ionica attracted investment from Coca-Cola and Unilever in 2018. The second category of mitigation is to block microplastics from entering the environment. This includes filtration systems, capture devices, and cleanup operations. The most famous is probably the ocean cleanup. It was founded way back in 2013, and its solution uses a giant U-shaped barrier that floats along with currents and naturally picks up any plastics along with it. Okay. In October 2019, they had a big breakthrough, capturing not just large chunks of plastic, but also microplastics down to one micrometer as well. This was significant because skeptics as early as 2018 were criticizing the ocean cleanup for not being able to get smaller fragments. Before even getting to the sea though, more interventions had been developed, like the one from Cleaner. They developed a microplastic filter for washing machines. The final approach is building better plastics. This means constructing plastics for materials that completely biodegrade or don't create microplastics at all. So 32% of all plastics leak into the environment globally, and our technology is designed for those plastics to enable them to return to nature. This is Richard Horn, by the way, the CEO of Polymateria. When plastics engineered with Polymateria's solution are exposed to the elements, they break down the chemical bonds in the plastic, transforming it to what we'd call an earth-friendly wax. Without the creation of any microplastics, within a two-year period, that plastic will fully biodegrade to CO2, water, and biomass. That's really cool. I, I should have been paying more attention in biology and chemistry class. One of the reasons I got interested in this topic is because of this story about taking microplastic out of your blood. It's from the Hustle newsletter, and if you like the video that you're watching right now, you'll absolutely love the newsletter too. Every Sunday, our team releases a new feature story on the internet's oddest obscurities and businesses you probably didn't know existed. Like the pop singer who built a million dollar ant empire. Scan the QR code on screen or check us out in the link in the description to get us in your inbox. All this sounds pretty idyllic, but I'm noticing there are two problems. The first is how much longer are my results supposed to take? Two weeks? Oh my God, I'm gonna be all plastic by then. The second problem is for all the wins that microplastic mitigation companies have been able to win, the industry is still held back by one big thing. Scale. Scale of everything. Speed, financials, demand. Globally, we produce over 400 million metric tons of plastic every year. And the amount of bioplastics we produce is only around 2.4 million metric tons. That's less than 1% of global annual production. Even if it doubled, quintupled, 20x, that'd still be a fraction of what's being pumped out every year. Next, the cost. Virgin plastic, which is a weird term for plastic that's completely brand new and has never been recycled before, is between $700 to $1,400 per ton. At current scale, recycled and bio-based alternatives cost about 1.5 to two times as much. Ionica, the company from earlier, just couldn't turn a profit because their chemically treated PET was just more expensive than virgin plastic. Ionica told an industry source that achieving a positive cash flow from its advanced polyester recycling technology will take too long. It's no wonder then that they filed for bankruptcy in October, 2024. Finally, funding and equity. In 2019, the Alliance to End Plastic Waste committed $1.5 billion over five years to various plastic waste termination solutions. From 2013 to mid-2025, in terms of publicly disclosed financial information, microplastics mitigation companies have received about $3.9 to $4.5 billion in funding. It may be two or three times more depending on private deals, but that gives you a sense of the scale of investment. That's a ton of money, but juxtapose that to the amount of money going into virgin plastic production capabilities by the end of 2026. An estimated $400 billion. That's an even bigger ton of money. <laughs> this isn't quite an apples to apples comparison, but it does give you a pretty clear picture. The level of investment in each of these industries is orders of magnitude apart. Learning all this, I'm not gonna lie, I'm not optimistic about the results of my test, which I think should be here by now. So, moment of truth. Wow. Um, dude, holy, whoa. I am way above average. Holy crap. So my microplastics total is 79% higher 
than every other user that's been messaged. That is so concerning. In the less than 10 micrometers range, whole, dude, higher than 85% of users that have been tested on this platform. That is insane. It's not like I'm going around like eating Tide Pods. It's like I'm just living my life and this is how much plastic is just in a single drop of my blood. That sucks. And then in the 10 to 30 micrometers range, I'm higher than 68% of other users that, wow. So I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm smash, I'm killing it in terms of how much plastic is, is inside me compared to the other people on this platform. You are part of 13% of users that measured between six to nine particles. That's crazy. Wow, okay, yeah, I didn't think, I'm not gonna lie, I didn't think it was gonna be this much. I thought it was gonna be like about average. And I also, I also didn't think it would affect me this much, right? But it's like, there's kind of nothing I can do about this. Yeah. This brings us back um, to the original question. Can biotech companies figure out a scalable way to get microplastics out of the environment and effectively therefore our bodies? And the answer is not yet. Not without much more investment, infrastructure and adoption. To be clear, I'm not criticizing any of these companies or even this industry. The truth is, these companies would need to match the level of production of virgin plastics, make it cheap enough to competitively purchase, scale adoption of those new solutions of plastics, and get microplastics out of the environment. One of the major challenges of global brands is many of them have been searching for a silver bullet that does not exist. There's always this desire to, to move from zero to perfection. Um, and actually you need to make incremental steps to get there to fuel innovation, to fuel continued development. No one company can do that. Without more investment in this industry, this remains a tall order. I hate to keep barreling down the bummer train here, but this isn't helped by some of the very companies that have taken green pledges. Coca-Cola, for example, set itself a goal to start selling soft drinks in bottles made from 25% recycled PET as far back as 1990, before I was born. But three decades later, their bottles still only contain 10%. Similarly, PepsiCo walked back a commitment of 25% recycled PET by 2025 and changed it to 40% by 2035. On the one hand, it makes sense that Pepsi and Coke invest in a Carbios or Ionica or Polymateria. They need those companies to actually reach the scale of recycled plastic they claim to want. On the other, Coke, Pepsi, Nestle, and Dannon all sent a letter in 2018 to EU member state governments about a bill that would mandate tethered bottle caps. This bill was meant to reduce litter. Caps had to be attached to bottles, and these companies were lobbying against it. And the Alliance to End Plastic Waste that pledged $1.5 billion I mentioned earlier, the majority of the Alliance members are from oil and petroleum companies. The companies who make virgin plastics, like ExxonMobil, Shell, and Dow Chemical. A lot of the smaller brands are more willing to move aggressively than the larger brands. They have a smaller product portfolio and they're changing that whole portfolio to something that they feel is more environmentally friendly. And they're often using that to capture market share from the larger brands that have had the market for a significant period of time. I think as a, as a society, as companies, as human beings, we need to do more. The environment improves when we fundamentally make changes across the world at the right scale. When you've engineered a world as reliant on plastics as we have, it's no surprise that breaking free feels almost impossible. But I'm reminded of lead paint, a beautifully cheap, useful, ubiquitous material, until we faced the truth of what it was doing to us and decided to stop using it. I'm just hoping that microplastics go the same way because a test like this should be a curiosity, not a necessity. For more business and tech stories like this, subscribe to The Hustle. And be sure to sign up for The Hustle newsletter for bold business stories.